My plan is to buy $1 billion of real estate in the next 18 months. Right now, we have over 10,000 apartment units and over 300 employees. To acquire $1 billion of apartments, we need to add about 14 properties and also add about 100 employees. I'm gonna go over exactly what we need to do to make this happen, and my entire plan on how to execute this. So it's important to understand that the process is always the same. And I wrote about it in this book, The ABCs of Real Estate Investing, almost 20 years ago. In that book, in chapter four, I wrote about the three levels of investing. So we always start with the same, but today I'm gonna to give you the other three, which are level four, five, and six, which is actually taking it all the way through the close, which is my second book, The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing. So level one, you need to focus on the macro, the trends. In other words, why, the why, why would you want to do something in a specific location? That's very, very, very important. So like I talk about in this book is that the market is more important than the property. And there are a lot of factors in level one that you need to understand in order to consider a new market or MR. You never start with the deal first and then try to sell yourself into it. You always start with the market because the market forces will determine the outcome largely. So level one would be taking a look at the big picture of the macro. So for example, what's going on with home ownership versus rental ownership? In other words, where is the economy going? Is our low interest rates pulling people out of rentals or are high interest rates pushing people back into? And that's a really important point because just like tides that come in and out, those can largely determine the outcome, the occupancy, and the performance of a rental market. Conversely, if you're a home builder, it can work in the opposite for you. The other very important point is affordability. That's another big macro problem, right? As we all know, single family houses are at all time highs and interest rates are all time highs. So mortgage payments are at all time highs for many people. Plus we have an inflation problem. What that does specifically when there's an affordability problem, it pushes people into rentals because they would traditionally own single family. That's another really good opportunity if you're a landlord and you're trying to invest in rentals. And then the third thing that can disrupt all of that is, of course, supply. When there's a lack of supply, it drives prices up. When there's an oversupply, it drives prices down. Just think of toilet paper during the pandemic. When toilet paper became scarce, the price went up and people were selling it for crazy amounts of money on the internet. Same thing with apartments. When there's a lot of apartments, then the pricing is better for the consumer. The pricing is better for the person that's buying the property, all of that stuff being equal. So what you're trying to look for is you're trying to look for the macro in level one, where there's a lot of people moving into the rental market, which is happening right now. And there's an affordability problem, which is also happening right now. And there's a temporary supply problem of oversupply of housing hitting the market for the next 18 to 24 months. And then after that, it drops off. That's level one. It's important to understand at this point, we haven't even selected a market or a property. We're just looking at the big macro forces. Level two is the actual market selection. Now this could be a city, it could be a state, it could be a country. It doesn't really matter. Now you start to look at where are people going. Every city, every country has people moving in and people moving out and they're growing for lots of different reasons. For example, when I was a kid, the country of Canada had an immigration program where people could invest a million dollars from wherever they were around the world and they could become a resident of that country. Well, what that did was it changed the dynamics of the country. Same thing can happen during the pandemic. We saw people moving all over the place. Work from home also dictates where people are going or not going. Safety, politics, weather, affordability, all of those things determine where people go. Here's the cool part. All of those things have data points. You want to try to follow population growth. In the last few years, the winners of population growth have been Texas, Florida, and the Carolinas, as an example. There's been other places, don't get me wrong, Tennessee, Arizona have also been winners, but they're not in the top three. Those forces are important because real estate only does well if there's actual people there. So when there's a lot of people moving to an economy, what does it do? It puts a lot of pressure on the school system. It puts a lot of pressure on the hospitals. It puts a lot of pressure on the restaurants. It puts a lot of pressure on the real estate prices. It puts a lot of pressure on the rental prices. All of those things ebb and flow based on people moving in and out of an area. Conversely, 
when people are moving out of an area, it does the opposite. You start to see home prices go down. You start to see rental prices go down. You start to see concessions. All of those things happen based on people. And of course, supply of inventory. So those are all the factors that you want to look for in level two. And once you start to figure that out, once you start to look for data points, for example, out-of-state driver's licenses turned in. When you move to a new area, you're supposed to turn in your driver's license and change your residence. So that's a data point that's all trackable. Moving trucks, one-way moving trucks from, uh, from U-Haul or North American van lines, those are data points. Those are all things that you can watch and learn from. And that's level two. If you don't know, I run MC companies. We have over 300 employees, own over 10,000 apartments, and have transacted over $3 billion in real estate transactions. Over the next 12 months, I plan on buying over a billion dollars of real estate. I'm gonna be doing a free webinar on June 25th, going over exactly what we're doing as a company. You can click here to sign up. Level three is actually so much more fun because now you're actually taking a look at certain cities and you're digging deeper and that would require a personal visit as an example. So for example, right now we're looking at Las Vegas. Las Vegas has a lot of people moving there for lots of reasons. I used to live there so I really understand the nuances of that economy. And one of the reasons that we haven't been investing there forever is because typically that ebbs and flows based on the casino business and how people are doing financially. So everybody flies to Vegas, spends a thousand dollars a day on rail cars, rooms, dinners, wine, all that stuff, and then they fly out. Well, when the economy's not doing well, inflation is hitting, then typically you start to see a reduction and you start to see the room prices actually come down just like anything. So when people start going there, you start to see the room prices being reduced. When there's a lot of people like during the Super Bowl or Final Four or all that, you start to see maximum prices just like anywhere else. What we are seeing is that that city specifically is trying to be not so much reliant on gaming. And so they're doing all kinds of things like, like F1 and the Spear and all kinds of other businesses are moving there because of the great political environment. Of course, the weather, the entertainment, and all of that. So Las Vegas is actually growing internally very, very nicely. Conversely, there's not a lot of new supply of apartments specifically being added. So you're starting to see home prices go up and you're starting to see rental prices go up. And so we believe that it is a market that we should be looking at. So when we decided to go look at Las Vegas, as an example, we flew up there and we met with property managers and brokers and all the things that I talk about in my book, just like I've been doing for the last 20 to 30 years. And through that research, through the local knowledge, they're actually saying this area is good, this area is not so good, this area is hot, this is where all the growth is heading. Every city has a blueprint of what it's doing and which way that it's growing. And so it's important that you understand that because you don't want to be a pioneer. You want to actually be in an area where it's growing toward. So all of those factors are important. And so once you start to narrow that down to certain submarkets, even inside of Las Vegas, you start to realize, just like my dad used to say, there's there's a good side of the tracks and a bad side of the tracks. The same is true for every city everywhere. So level four is actually putting together the entire team. So investor relations, the analysts, the acquisitions, the process of bringing deal flow into our business. There needs to be people specifically accountable for those things. Each and every week for 90 minutes, my partner Ross and I are on an investment committee call. And on that call, we look at three or four deals that have already been vetted by that team. And that team would have already probably looked at 10 to 15, even 20 deals during that week, but they bring us the top three as an example. It's important to understand when I started, I didn't have a team like this. So I was the one that flew up and met with everybody. And I was the one that flew up and, and took a look at these submarkets. And I was the one that started looking at deal flow. And at night, I was crunching all the numbers and doing all the underwriting. And so I was the one that was pushing the whole thing. But now as you start to scale, you're able to start to find people to do that for you so that you can operate quicker and more efficiently and of course, more strategically. It's also important to understand that as you guys know, I haven't even talked about money yet. You don't need money to do this. At this point, it's all time. It's all learning and time. It's vision and ideas and strategy. 
The money comes when the deal is presented. You don't need the money first. In other words, how can somebody invest in something that you don't even have yet? So you actually have to do all of this homework and then it's not as much of a sales job because it's just literally math. So once you've done all this homework and you've put together the story and the idea of exactly where you wanna be, then you actually find a deal and then it all starts to work. And that deal itself is the sales piece that actually gets you the money. You don't need the money first. You just need to assemble your team loosely, find out where the best places to be are, and then find the deal and then present it to the people. So here we are in level four and we're at the investment committee level. And don't forget these analysts have now vetted this, but this is something that I used to do so I can fully understand it. And it's really the same three things that we teach here at KimMacroy.com. It's income minus expenses is your net operating income. Minus debt is cash flow. That's it. It's the same thing that happens whether you're buying a single family house or a big 300 unit apartment building. It doesn't really matter. It's the exact same thing. So whether you have one tenant or 350 tenants, it doesn't matter. They're either paying or they're not. The rent is what it is. There's vacancy or there isn't. It's all the same. It's just scale. And then the expenses, same thing. A single family house has property taxes. So does the 350 unit. It has insurance. It has utilities. It has capital work. It has maintenance required. It has landscaping. It has all that kind of stuff. The only difference is that it's larger. But the net operating income strategy is the exact same whether it's a single family house or it's 350 units. So each property has to have some kind of a story. So in other words, how's it managed? What's the occupancy? Are there a lot of people not paying rent? Who's the ownership? What's the management company? Are they doing a good job? How are the expenses? Are the expenses managed well or not? All of that stuff fits into the story. Do we like the location? What is the age? Is the area growing? Is it not growing? Is there in-migration or out-migration? There, are there big employers around? Where do people live? Is it walkable? Is there lots of grocery stores and all that kind of stuff? All that gets considered, including school systems. All of that is considered before we even make an offer. We've done all of this work in Las Vegas, as an example, and we currently have a deal in escrow in an area called Green Valley, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. It's an affluent area of Las Vegas. Now, there's not a lot of room for growth in the area, which is good from a supply standpoint. The price of houses in the area are expensive, which is also good if you own rentals. The school system is among the best in the area, as an example. And in our opinion, there is room to improve the operations of the property. We're currently in due diligence on this property right now, and this is just one of the properties of the 14 that we'll need to buy in order to hit our $1 billion. So level five is the actual physical due diligence and checking all this information out, because what you have is you have a seller saying one thing and a broker saying another. And then of course the buyer, which is us, actually having to verify it all. As, as you guys know from reading my book, trust but verify. So there's a process of walking all the units. There's a process of checking all the rents and making sure that the rent roll is accurate. Taking a look at vacancy in the area, taking a look at rents in the area, taking a look at the market pricing. Is the area contracting or expanding? Which one? because all that stuff is important. Once you figure all that out, then you actually take a look at all the operating expenses as well. Are there areas to save? And are there areas that the current ownership is overspending? So all of that stuff is going to be vetted out at this point. And then of course, the last piece is going to be the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So once we have the property in escrow, you have to go out and price that. As we all know, the cost of debt and the cost of equity is actually up right now. That's not necessarily good for an investment. So the property, of course, pays everyone. The property pays the debt back. The property pays the equity back. And so the property actually has to perform to be able to pay those two things. Uh, this is the biggest mistake that a lot of people got into in the last several years is that they were actually buying properties because it was so easy to raise equity and debt was also very easy to be placed on these properties. And now the debt has reprised and equity has reprised and the property values have gone down over the last couple of years. 
So now is the perfect time to be able to buy some of those problems. And that's precisely what we're doing. But you always have to factor in the cost of debt and the cost of equity, because ultimately the only thing that's gonna pay everybody back is the actual property. So finding the property, finding the market, all those forces actually help the operations. And then of course, being able to roll in our own property management company on top of that is the last piece and the last level, and that is the actual performance. Once you know the cost of the equity, and once you know the cost of the debt, and once you know all the information from due diligence, that's when you can put the business plan together and actually put it out to all your investors. Because the investors are gonna invest in the story. They're gonna invest in the upside. They're gonna invest in the why, which is what we started back in level one and level two. Then of course, our job is to perform. So once our due diligence team rolls out of there, our ops team or operational team will come in from the property management standpoint. And that is actually when the whole thing starts to perform. That's the process for every single asset that we have to go through levels one through six. One thing to be aware of is cash flow pays for everything. So this is why it's important to buy for cash flow and not just for capital gain. And this is precisely what people got in trouble doing is the property needs a cash flow on day one. And there needs to be some story to grow that cash flow because that cash flow is actually what pays the investors. Don't forget, investors have choices. Investors have a lot of choices on where to put their money. And one of the things that they're going to be doing is investing in your team, investing in the story, investing in the property, but also investing for tax reasons because there's a lot of really good tax strategies that can be used when you're acquiring property like this. And a lot of, so a lot of people want the cash flow and the tax benefits as well. So all of that needs to be inside of your business plan. And I think the mistake a lot of people made in the last few years is that a lot of people bought based on the market continuing to go up. As we all know, that has not happened. The values of most properties have gone down in the last few years, and therefore the quick exits are not available to those folks. Whereas we take a long-term approach. A lot of the properties that we've owned have been over 15 years long, and we've done two or three cash out refinances along the way, which of course is tax-free. Because when you do a cash out refi, that's actually tax-free because you're actually using debt to return equity. The IRS wants their pound of flesh when you sell something. So if you buy something low, sell it when you're high, there's a capital gain and there's a tax. But when you buy something low and write it up and then you refinance it and you do not sell, you actually can distribute that money tax-free to the investors because you're not selling. You're actually just like you're harvesting a cash out refi on a home, for example. It's the same concept. It's just you're doing it on a 50, 60, 70, $100 million project. So once you actually close on a property, the whole strategy is all boils down to operations. And of course, at our company, we do all that in-house. This is when you start to hire people in the corporate office for the accounting and for the property management side of the house. That person is responsible for performing to the business plan. They're also responsible for contributing to the details inside of the business plan. So everyone's aligned from the beginning. The property management company helps during the due diligence. They're aware of what's in the business plan. Everybody agrees and blesses it. And then we actually hold that document up and say, this is the business plan and this is what we expect. You all agreed to it. And that's the plan that we use moving forward. So each and every week we get occupancy reports, we get expense reports, and of course every month we get financials to be able to monitor and manage the cash flow projections based on the actuals and the business plan. And that's where the magic is, and that's where the asset management kicks in, where you're actually managing the investment and managing the property manager. And that's actually when it starts to get really fun. It's because at that point, as you can imagine, not everything goes the way that you thought it was going to be in a document. But then that's when you sit down and you start to get creative and you start to figure out how to grow your occupancy, how to cut your expenses, how to grow the income, how to better manage the property for the residents and the customers that are coming in, how to attract more traffic. And of course, anything that has to do with the lender or any capital work that's needed like new roofs or paint or parking lots or whatever it might be. Essentially, as a property manager, you're trying to blend into the community and be part of that community, have goodwill 
in that community. So you continue to attract people and people love living at this property. That's the whole goal is to have the occupancy high, the expenses as low as they can be and kick out as much cash as you can to the investors. And uh, then our company, of course, distributes to the investors each and every quarter. And if we do not perform the business plan, there's communication as to why and our plan to fix that moving forward. It's very important to understand that all of those things are that are pulling levers behind the curtain. There are lots of things that go right and there are lots of things that go wrong, but this is very normal in a real estate investment. And that is the job entirely of the property manager and the asset managers to be able to communicate to the investors as to what's going on with that investment. You might be thinking, what does this have anything to do with me getting to a billion dollars of properties in the next 18 months? This process is always the same for each property. I wrote about it 20 years ago. It's the same today. It's the exact same process that every single person needs to go through for every single acquisition. All I have to do is do this 14 times for the next 18 months and it'll equal $1 billion. Once you have your systems in place, you do not reinvent the wheel. They just get better and better and more refined over time. In my 35 years of real estate, I promised myself there's one mistake I would never do again. You'll have to make sure you watch that here.